Good evening, and welcome to the Marin Minor Cook Afternoon. My name is Henrietta Toivonen, and I'm one of the Ath Fellows this year. Since its emergence in the 1980s, HIV has been a disease that incites widespread fear and misconceptions. The discrimination that people with the condition fa have faced during the early times has carried through to the present. The stigmatization of HIV AIDS has led to severe abuses of the individual rights of the affected people. Even with easier and faster access to information about the condition, very negative connotations are still associated which with HIV AIDS. Scott Shadas is a senior attorney and HIV pro project director at Lambda Legal, where he litigates impact cases involv involving HIV discrimination, criminalization, and access to care. He was the point person for Lambda Legal's work on the repeal, repeal of the HIV travel ban and has worked on the, on the legislative reform of laws um, criminalizing conduct based on HIV status. He was also recently appointed to the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS, where he co-chairs the Disparities Committee. Mr. Um, Shadis Athanin's speech is co-sponsored by and, and a collaborative effort with the uh, Claremont University Consortium's Health Education Out Outreach, as well as with Foothill, Foothill AIDS Project and Pomona College International Initiatives. Tonight's event aims to raise awareness and solidarity for the World AIDS Day on December 1st. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording is strictly prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Shades to the Athenaeum. Thank you so much, Henrietta, for that introduction. It is great to be here. I'm so um, pleased to be before you all, and it's so nice to see such a great turnout. I was just having a wonderful conversation with all of the students that I was getting to speak with at the table here, so um, I'm really looking forward to, to talking with all of you tonight. And I did tell them, I'm thinking this is a talk, not a speech, um, <laughs> nothing that formal. Um, I'm really here to talk and to try and share with you some of my insights, some of the things that I've learned uh, in the work that I've been doing. Um, over these past uh, eight years or so. Um, so, um, a little bit of background on, oh, I gotta grab my clicker. Um, a little bit of background on who I am and w what we are about, um, and then we'll get started into the substance of the speech. So I work for Lambda Legal, and Lambda Legal is a national organization committed to achieving the full recognition of the civil rights of lesbians, gay men, bisexuals, transgender people, and those with HIV through impact litigation, education, and public policy work. How many people in the room have heard of Lambda Legal and kind of know what we do? Okay, a few, a few. So good, I'll, I'll tell you, the rest of you, what it is that we do. So Lambda Legal um, is probably best known for the work that it has done very recently on marriage equality in this country. So we had one of the cases that went up to the Supreme Court and there was a kind of a small decision that came out in June that established the right to same-sex marriage on behalf of, um, of all people uh, in the United States, in all states, um, a very historic thing. But we do a bunch of other, we work on a bunch of other areas, and we have done work on a bunch of other areas for many years, and HIV is one of those areas. So how do we do our work? Um, there's three things that are there at the end, impact litigation, education and public policy work. I'm guessing that pu most people probably know what education and public policy work is about, but you may not be as familiar with impact litigation. So impact litigation is the idea that you bring a case um, that is on behalf usually of just a single plaintiff, sometimes a group of plaintiffs like we did in our marriage cases, um, and you're advancing the interests of that particular party, because as an attorney you kind of have to do that. Uh, you have an ethical obligation. but in an impact litigation case, you're also attempting to advance the rights of a whole constituency that that person represents. So if you're doing a case on behalf of a person living with HIV, it's on an issue that you think, as an organization, will somehow affect the law for the better for everybody else, whether that's creating new precedent, um, perhaps creating a pathway in the law that wasn't obvious to people before. Um, sometimes it's just bringing attention to, a, to an issue. Um, by bringing a case and sort of getting it pushed out there into the media. But that's what we do when we do impact litigation, that's what that's about. HIV Project. I'm the director of the HIV Project at Lambda Legal. Um, I've been there a total of about eight years and I've been the project director for about six years. Um, and we brought the first HIV discrimination lawsuit in 1983. 
um, when we success successfully prevented a New York co-op from evicting a doctor who was treating people with HIV out of the his offices in the co-op. And we're going to talk a little bit more about sort of that, the beginning of HIV, but um, just think about that. I mean, he was always just doing his job, and they didn't want him treating people who looked like they were sick or who they were concerned might some way be contagious um, out of the co-op in New York. And so we were on the scene at the very beginning, um, and I'm proud to say have been there ever since, uh, working on a number of areas, all of which are, some of which are listed here. So that's where we are in the HIV project. Uh, so, I'm gonna bring up this next photo. I decided, <laughs> I decided I couldn't give this talk tonight without acknowledging this. Um, for those of you who, I don't know, were living under a rock um, <coughs> and didn't hear, um, yesterday Char Charlie Sheen announced that he has been living with HIV for, um, for a number of years. Um, and uh, it was kind of a big deal. Um, and uh, you know, it really is kind of telling. I, I don't consider uh, Charlie Sheen a poster child. Uh, for HIV or for uh, any of the work that we do. Uh, who knows, maybe he will come, maybe he will turn into that, but certainly at this point I don't think of him as that. But it does raise some interesting issues around HIV and it actually raises uh, the topic of my talk tonight, uh, which is really focused on stigma. Um, and so I just want you to think for a minute about what kind of stigma there must be around living with HIV if you are willing to spend millions of dollars, millions of dollars, to prevent people from learning about your HIV status. Because that's why he finally came out and told people, was because he was sick of paying off people to keep it confidential, to keep it quiet. So what kind of stigma is involved there? And uh, it's an interesting thing to think about how that differs from uh, what it means to be gay today, and how many people are openly gay. And uh, there's much less shame, I would uh, posit, in uh, being gay than there is in being HIV positive. So how many of you knew, we've got to, got to at least get that off of there. Um, <laughs> I'll talk about that in a minute. But how many of you knew that we have a cure and we have a vaccine for HIV? Raise your hand if you knew those things. Oh, there's a few, but most of you don't. Well, I'll actually say, uh, it's kind of okay if you didn't know that, because technically it's not true. <laughs> um, but what is true is that we have what would be considered a functional vaccine and a functional cure. It's not technically fit the definition of either of those things, because a cure would be like you get to stop treatment and it doesn't recur, right? But we have a functional HIV vaccine and a functional HIV cure. I'm a person living with HIV. I've been living with HIV for 16 years now. I guess I'm now moving into the long-term survivor category. Um, uh, and we love our long-term survivors. There's people that I know and people that I work with who've been you know, living with HIV since 1983, since we won that first that lawsuit that I was telling you about. So it's wonderful that, that we still have some of our elders in this community. Um, but I'm essentially, because I have access to care and treatment, um, and I'm on that treatment and I can adhere to my medications, uh, my life expectancy, my prognosis and my life expectancy are fantastic. Um, really almost the same as anyone um, who is not living with HIV. So that's pretty close to a cure. Yes, I have to take my pill every day, um, but we get it down to one pill. Um, it's pretty easy for me, for someone with access to care um, and with all the support in place necessary to be able to, to adhere to those medical regimens. Um, and then we also have, in PrEP, how many people know what PrEP is? How many people have ever heard of PrEP? All right, a smattering there as well. So PrEP is this amazing uh, discovery uh, where we learned that if you give a person who is HIV negative, but at some risk of HIV, um, they're having sex with people of an unknown HIV status, um, and, and or with an HIV positive partner, um, that if we give them two of the medications that most, most people living with HIV take in a combination of three or four medications, um, that if they take that medication on a regular basis, every day, they can avoid contracting HIV. 
um, even when they are having sex with an HIV positive partner. Um, so again, yes, they have to take it every day, not ideal, costs money, not, not cheap, but essentially uh, a vaccine. So if we have those things, and actually we've had the treatment certainly since 1996, we've only recently learned that it indeed um, can uh, act as, uh, that people on it are actually have an undetectable viral load, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But they've been on the treatments, we've had the, the cure, if you will, since 1996, um, and now we've learned about PrEP, and now that's been rolled out, and yet we still have 50,000 new infections in the United States every year. And there are approximately, what do I have here? I think 9,000 uh, 9, people dying of an AIDS-related complication or illness every year. So thousands of people are still dying. New infections are still happening at a rapid rate, even though we essentially have a vaccine and a cure. So what I want to explore tonight is why that is and how we get to the place where we have actually eliminated new AIDS, uh, new AIDS cases and new HIV infections. So I'm going to take you back a little bit to the beginning. Um, and certainly some of the people in this room were, were around um, for the beginning of HIV AIDS and know, uh, and probably and know better than I, actually, um, this story. But uh, I'm the one up here, so I get to tell it. <laughs> um, because there are people in the room, I think, who don't know some of this story, and I think it's really important that we remember our history, and I think it tells us a lot about how we are where we are now. So uh, in the beginning, um, and actually that uh, interesting side note here, most people think, oh yeah, HIV, when did it begin? What would most people say? 81, right? That's when HIV started. Actually, what we're learning is that HIV has been around since they think the 30s. Yeah. Um, and they, you know, they're trying to trace back when it actually started. There were actually cases, and they think that it moved from uh, the simian population uh, into the human population, perhaps from um, people who were, uh, were harvesting uh, s monkeys, simians, what's called bushmeat um, in, in Africa, in parts of Africa, and that that's how it actually made its way into the human population, was from the butchering of the, uh, the simians that were being eaten. Um, and then it just took a long time for that to, to incubate and sort of turn into enough of, uh, of a problem and an epidemic that we first started noticing it in 1981. But it's been around for a really long time. Just kind of an interesting side note. I figure you should get some tidbits here that, you know, maybe you didn't know. Um, so in the beginning, it was definitely thought of as a disease of gay people, homosexuals, actually, because that was the word that was used at the time. It's not really a word that we consider politically correct anymore, um, but it was homosexuals. And in, in fact, it was what people used to talk about as the four H's. You were in the 4-H club um, if you uh, were susceptible to HIV. And of course, at that time, we didn't even know that it was called HIV, that that was the problem. But it was uh, homosexuals, um, Haitians, um, hemophiliacs who were hit hard at the beginning of the epidemic because, of course, it got into the blood supply and, I mean, basically everyone who was a hemophiliac, uh, almost, it was a huge percentage, um, became infected with HIV. And then the last group was heroin users. So that was the four groups. And think about all those groups, all groups that at that time in particular were highly marginalized, right? Um, we're not talking about the folks that were in the privileged part of, the, of society. We're talking about people that were maligned, that were marginalized, that were oftentimes hidden and underground. Um, and so a lot of stigma from the very get-go surrounded HIV. And then we figured out that it was sexually transmitted. Well, you know, in this country, put sex on top of anything and you've immediately created, you know, a, a great deal more stigma. Um, and so it took the folks, like the folks in this picture, um, a little while just to get anybody to pay attention and to care. And if you haven't seen this film, How to Survive a Plague, um, go see it. It's the documentary that was uh, nominated for an Oscar a few years ago. It's really good um, and, and tells the story of ACT UP, 
and people but don't know about ACT UP, it was a group of primarily people living with HIV, but also people at risk of HIV um, who formed in New York um, and then in other places across the country in the early 80s um, to, to get government to pay attention, to get the mayor of New York at the time, Ed Koch, to pay attention, um, to get people actually working on addressing the problem, talking about the problem. Ronald Reagan didn't say the word um, AIDS, I think until the last year of his presidency or something like that. Um, and so no one wanted to talk about it. And these folks were out and they were screaming, as you can see, my friend Peter Staley, who is a long-term survivor, he's still with us, even though he's been HIV positive since about this time. Um, they had to, they engaged in public, um, in disobedience, civil disobedience, in order to get people to start paying attention. They did some amazing stuff. Some people have a problem with this film and that they feel like it romanticizes a little bit the beginning of the epidemic. Um, but I think it, regardless of whether it does that or not, it still has an important story to tell and you should go and, and check it out. So it took people some time to actually get um, anybody to pay attention. And, um, and then something happened that I think is really important, part of my story here tonight, something called the Denver Principles. So I'm guessing a lot of people in this room probably haven't heard of the Denver Principles. Uh, this was a group of people living with HIV who were at a uh, gay and lesbian health conference. And I'm using my terms particularly here. You notice I didn't have the LGBT there. That's, this is because this, we're talking about a time before people included transgender people within that, that group or bisexuals. So it was a gay and lesbian health conference. And um, a bunch of them got together to talk about this plague that was affecting this population. And they issued a manifesto, I, I would call it, for people living with HIV. Um, and I don't know if you can really read the first uh, statement there, but I think it's the most important one. So I put it onto this slide, saying, uh, we condemn attempts to label us as victims, a term which implies defeat. And we are only occasionally patients, a term which implies passivity, helplessness, and dependence upon the care of others. We are people with AIDS. And it was a really powerful thing for them to declare that, and then the principles go on and they talk about what other people can do, what all people can do, and then what people living with HIV or AIDS at that time is really the term that was used um, to do. And it was a document of empowerment. It was the idea that you were no longer going to be victims to the power structures that existed. Um, and that we were going to stand up and be counted and that we weren't going to be quiet. So the silence equals death um, sort of meme, uh, now that's what we'd call it, but it was a, st a logo or a, um, a standard that was used by the, the ACT UP folks. It was very real. It was, we're not going to be quiet because to be quiet equals death. Something else that was interesting about this group and this important manifesto that they put forth was um, the people being affected by HIV AIDS at the beginning of the epidemic were some people um, who had never been, who had lived a privileged life, if I'm just gonna throw it out there, right? They had led a relatively privileged life. And so for the first time, they were being affected by something that no one was paying attention to and no one seemed to care about. You know, the people, there were people on Wall Street, right? That had lived and they, they weren't out, they were closeted um, gay men. Um, and they'd kind of been able to pass their, their lives and live in that place of relative privilege. And so for the first time, they were being marginalized uh, in a way that they weren't used to. And I think that was at least part of the impetus for ACT UP, right? It was part of the reason that people were like, wait a minute, this is happening to me now. We, I'm not gonna let this happen. And they went out on the streets and started protesting. Now, those weren't the only people affected by HIV AIDS. Those weren't the only folks um, who were out there protesting. There were people of color. Um, there were transgender people. But I think that part of the impetus came from sort of the whack in the face that the people who were used to living in a place of privilege, used to having access to health care and things that took care of them, um, when they were being denied that, it made them act. So there were some OK things about their realization that that wasn't the way it was for everybody. Um, so two interesting developments that I would say came out of this, the Denver Principles, oops, I got ahead of myself. The Denver Principles, and by the way, I'm not relying too much on the slides. They're mostly there so that you have something to look at besides me. 
um, <laughs> the whole time. But two of the interesting things I would say came out of the Denver Principles and this movement were, uh, one, a patient-centered or patient-driven model of healthcare. I think it's important for us not to forget that while this was a plague and there were some horrible, horrible things that people lived through, and, and really, the people that lived through the worst of the HIV AIDS epidemic, they have, some of them have PTSD from it. I mean, it was a highly traumatic thing. There were people who, who lost multiple people in a week. It was a regular thing that their friends, multiple friends, were dying in a week. So you don't go through something like that without suffering um, to some degree. But on the flip side of that, there are some very positive things that came out of HIV AIDS. And one of them was this move towards a patient-centered or patient-driven model of care. Um, and we probably, some people in this room probably don't even realize or recognize that we now live in a world where a patient care, um, where health care is more patient focused. Um, it used to be that the doctor was God and the doctor knew everything. And you didn't question the doctor. Oftentimes you didn't say much when you went to see the doctor. He told you what was going on. He examined you and told you what your problems were. They did the tests and figured everything out. HIV created a situation where the patients got so fed up that they started educating themselves. And they went into the doctor and said, hey, I read about this. I want to know about this. This is what's happening to me. I heard about this treatment that's available in this place. Why can't I be on this? Um, people in ACT UP went and started talking to government about why aren't we moving these drugs along in the pipeline, these experimental drugs. Why aren't we moving them along more quickly? And so, it was a much different model of care that was in place before that. And now I would say we're all sort of in that space. How many people have Googled and figured out, based on their own symptoms, what they think is wrong before you go in to see the doctor? Now, does it drive some doctors crazy? Yeah. Um, is, is, is a little bit of information sometimes a, a bad thing? <laughs> um, or uh, too much information a bad thing? Absolutely. But patients are going in with a lot more information at their disposal. And they're asking the questions. And yeah, maybe the doctor has to explain to them why that's not the case, but better that they ask the question and move it along. So that's one of the benefits that I think is really interesting from the HIV AIDS epidemic in the early years. The other is that HIV kind of took the gay civil rights movement, and again, I'm using that term deliberately, um, from its adolescence, if you will, into adulthood. So there was, you know, if we, if we figure Stonewall is sort of the, the real beginning of the modern uh, gay civil rights movement, here we are 13 years later, 12, 13 years later. So the movement's kind of in its adolescence. And the fact that there were uh, all of these gay men being affected, um, and they could no longer sort of stand on the sidelines. It wasn't so easy to remain in the closet anymore. When your friends are dying all around you and you have to stand up for yourself and, and name yourself and be out there and be out, um, it, it transformed, really, the gay civil rights movement. And people started demanding their rights as gay people. Uh, first, gay men, I would say, a lot of it, although there was people from the women's movement that were there very strongly as well. Um, and so the lesbian and gay people really, it changed their movement to have HIV. And it became a focus in the early years, or in those years, of the um, gay civil rights work, um, was the HIV-related work. Uh, and it also showed that group of people what could be accomplished when people stood together and refused to be silent and pushed upon the structures of power um, spoke truth to power, um, and yeah, I would say it really did transform the gay civil rights movement, which is kind of ironic because the next thing I'm going to talk about is how we kind of decided at some point to de-gay the HIV movement, right? So people realized that a lot of people thought of it as a gay disease um, because it had arisen in, within that community, um, or that's where people noticed it first, um, and so there was an effort across the board, I would say, to, to send the message that this is not just about gay people, that anybody can get HIV, which we all know now, today, I mean, it almost seems like a, an obvious thing. Um, although, I would also say that there's a, a lot of denial um, still about the risk that some people are at. Um, but nonetheless, there was a, a, I would say, a deliberate decision 
to de-gay things um, and to, to push this message that HIV could happen to anyone and that it was um, everyone's disease and everyone's problem. And that was a great thing needed to get that message out there. However, at the same time, it kind of created this weird split within the gay community and the HIV AIDS advocacy community. They were kind of together for a period of time, were very closely associated. And then after that, and actually we're going to talk about after the introduction of protease inhibitors, they really kind of grew apart. And it was people that worked on gay civil rights and people that worked in HIV AIDS. Um, and and uh, while they used to be housed in one place, they grew into this separate thing. And AIDS actually, you know, some people say it grew into an entire industry. And there's lots of critiques of that, um, AIDS Inc. Um, but they grew apart. And so for my purposes, that's kind of an important piece of all of this. Um, because I think it's time to actually bring them back together. Because I think they're more powerful when they are together. Part of what led to the growing apart piece, and I should be checking my time, um, was the introduction of protease inhibitors. So in 1996, for the first time, we had these medications that um, finally sort of broke the puzzle um, in terms of HIV treatment. And incredibly important, right? We figured out that, yes, all these individual medications were having uh, different ways of attacking the virus, but unfortunately, the virus would mutate around them um, after a period of time. And what we learned, and the, the medical research did an absolutely amazing uh, thing uh, through this period, is that if you attacked the virus with multiple medications, three medications, all at the same time, including a protease inhibitor, at least at the beginning, they, all the combinations included a protease inhibitor, um, that you could confuse the virus enough that it couldn't mutate around the treatments. Um, and that's when we saw this huge turn. And there were literally people who came back from the brink of death. I think Peter Staley, who you saw the picture of, was one of them. I know Sean Strube, uh, who was the founder of Pause Magazine uh, and now runs an organization called Zero, was one of them. Um, they, were, they were the walking dead. Um, I'm not making any reference to a TV show there. But um, they came back to life as a result of these treatments. So an amazing, wonderful thing. But they also had this other effect. And that is that they were great for people who had access. People like me. Um, but what we ended up doing is we didn't provide access to everyone. They're, they're, expense, they're medications that cost a lot. And we can critique all of that. And we can talk about you know, drug companies and why they're priced the way they are. That's not really the focus of my talk tonight. Um, the point is that the people who didn't have access stayed where they were in terms of their uh, disease progression, in terms of the outcomes within those communities, while communities of privilege, um, certainly white, you know, middle class gay men, um, tremendous improvements in their health outcomes because they had access to care. So what we are seeing today is actually the sort of result of all that, the disparities that we see um, between populations in terms of HIV is horrible. Um, I, can't, I don't have the statistic off the top of my head, but the chances of a black gay man acquiring HIV by the time he is 40, I want to say are somewhere upwards of 50%. That's pretty high. Um, and, and there are lots of, of reasons that go into that. I just want to make clear, it's not about um, more risk behaviors in a certain population. In fact, the opposite is true. So there have been studies done. Um, it has to do with, for instance, the prevalence within a certain community and that community's access to care. So one of the things I kind of touched on before, but I didn't really cover it well, is what we know about treatment as prevention. This is really important. You heard it talked about a little bit if you paid any attention to the Charlie Sheen stuff that, that came out yesterday. But the fact is, is that if someone is on effective HIV treatment, um, they have almost, if, and they, so they have a suppressed viral load as a result, they have, we think, close to zero or zero chance of transmitting HIV. They become essentially non-infectious. That is huge. That is more effective than condoms, right? It is at preventing HIV. Condoms do a lot of other things that that treatment doesn't do. <laughs> right? 
But the fact is, is th that statistically, they're as effective, more effective than condoms. Um, and, um, and so, but what that can do as well is exacerbate these disparities. So in a community where you don't have great access to healthcare, where the stigma is really high, um, and where people, so the other people with whom you are in your social networks, it, within sexual networks, also don't have access to care. So the HIV positive individuals are not getting to that suppressed viral load place where they essentially can't transmit the virus. That means there's going to be more transmissions that happen within that community where prevalence is high and treatment is low. Um, those are the things that are creating the disparities that we have in the United States today. Um, and that is a huge problem. Um, and it's actually one of the things that I get to focus on. So um, I think it was mentioned in my bio that I am a member of the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS. And I am a co-chair of the Disparities Committee there. Um, and so we're tasked with trying to help the administration figure out um, what it needs to do to address those disparities. Oh, another disparity that I should talk about because I think it will surprise people is the fact that HIV has now moved into the South. That is the biggest problem geographic area in the country. We sort of think of HIV as being in you know, New York and San Francisco and LA and that that's where we need to address it. The fact is that the South has the greatest number of uh, the new infections. If you actually look up the five cities with uh, the highest number of new HIV infections um, from a couple of years ago, uh, the latest statistics that we have, four of the five cities are all in the South. It's Miami, it's Jackson, Mississippi, it's New Orleans, uh, it's Washington, D.C. Um, those are the places where we're seeing the greatest number of new infections. So we have to rethink. And again, the disparities are sort of created and maintained because of some of the things that I'm going to talk about next. Um, so one of those things is that I was talking about patient-centered, patient-empowered care. Um, that's a great model, except we forgot to empower all of the people who are the patients. So it works really well for the people who go into those doctor encounters fully empowered and know their stuff and feel confident about the relationship with the doctor and that they're not going to lose their health care or if they're not going to be denied care because they reveal certain information or, or you know, question what they're getting or just that they've been um, educated about HIV and have enough information to go in there with. Um, if you don't empower the people, then an, a patient-driven or a patient-empowered model of care doesn't work as well. So that's one of the issues, is we need to empower the people um, who are getting the care. This is sort of the Bible, if you will, of HIV AIDS treatment professionals. Uh, it's called the Gardner Treatment Cascade, because a gentleman named uh, Gardner created it. But this gives you an idea of why um, we still have new HIV infections in this country and why we are nowhere near ending AIDS, which is within our grasp. We're just not doing it. So at the time that this came out, there were about 1.2 million people in the United States living with HIV. Of those 1.2 million people, about 82% knew about their HIV infection. So they had been tested and diagnosed with HIV. Then there's another drop to people who are linked into care. So in other words, they get the test. A lot of people aren't ever linked into someone who's going to take care for them. And so they disappear and they get lost. About 725,000 people. So now we're at about 60 some percent of the total number of people living with HIV. Then we go to people who are retained in care, right? So it doesn't really help if once you get to care, you don't stay in care because we know that the treatments only work if you get them on a consistent basis. And it's not just getting the, the pill, it's getting the care that goes with it. You have to be monitored. You know, I get my blood drawn, mine's out every six months now, but it, you know, in the beginning it was every three months and you have to have my blood drawn and they have to check and make sure and see how the virus is doing and if, uh, if my immune system is um, uh, circumventing it in any way and they have to check the function of it on my uh, kidneys and my liver. And so you have to have actual medical care not just a pill. Um, and you have to have the support to, um, to stay on that care. And there's a whole bunch of things that are required in order to stay in care, right? You have to have stable housing. 
You have to have food security. You have to have, sometimes you have to have a way of having someone watch your kids so you can get to a medical appointment. Um, there are a bunch of, you need employment, uh, really. Uh, steady employment is one of the greatest indicators of a person's ability to remain adherent to their medications. Um, so all of those things go into whether you are actually adherent. So once you're on ART, and that was pretty close to retained in care, a lot of the people who are on ART who were retained in care, and now I would venture to say, because of some new guidelines, everybody who's in care gets ART. ART is antiretroviral therapy, the medications I was talking about. Um, everybody gets that from the get-go. Um, so those are two that are close to the same. But then finally, we get to the last category of the people who actually achieve viral suppression. When he did this cascade in, uh, I think, 2009, we were at 28% only, or maybe it was even 25% of the people, that was 25%, of the people living with HIV in the country. We're the richest nation in the world, and only 25% of our people have, were virally suppressed on a disease that we know how to treat. That is, that is a shame. That should be a public, a national disgrace that we are not doing a better job. Um, it's gotten a little bit better in recent years, um, and now we're up to about 30%, but still, that's pretty darn low. And so, um, what are the things that affect why we end up with this cascade? I talked about some of them and the social determinants of health. Um, we've done uh, some attempts to um, ameliorate some of those social determinants of health, kind of in a specific way, um, the Ryan White healthcare program. How many of you know the name Ryan White? A few more people, but actually interesting how many don't. So Ryan White was a young man who was kicked out of his school when he was, when they discovered, he was a hemophiliac, I believe, living with HIV, and um, the school decided that he couldn't be around other students. Uh, this is well after we knew how HIV was and was not transmitted, um, and uh, unfortunately, eventually, he died. Um, and in his honor, we uh, named this CARE Act that provides care to a lot of the people living with HIV in this country, or it did, prior to implementation of the ACA. So we, we're working on some of the social determinants of health, but there's a lot of them that we do not do a good job of addressing. A lot of the ones I just named about social, uh, or housing insecurity, food insecurity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other thing that we really don't recognize, the role that it plays, is stigma. And so this is a really great graphic that was put together by the people at the National Alliance of State and Territorial AIDS Directors. Um, and they call it the bar before the bars. Because stigma and all of the other things that sort of come along, racism, poverty, homophobia, violence, misogyny, homelessness, um, it plays a huge role before we even get to who's diagnosed. Before we even get to a place where we can get people in to get tested, we're dealing with all of the stigma that surrounds an HIV diagnosis. Because plenty of people think, I don't want to know. Especially if you don't have access to care, if you don't have any way of addressing the problem or feel like you don't have any way of addressing the problem, well then, why do you want to know? That's what, at least what goes on in some people's minds. So the stigma is huge, and it's something that you know, I'm constantly trying to address uh, in my work. Um, and I consider that uh, one of the two twin pillars of the HIV project. So one is access to care itself, so making it possible so that everyone can actually get to care, and the other is freedom from uh, stigma and discrimination. And this is actually kind of baked into the National HIV AIDS Strategy. It's a great statement. It's the mission statement from the strategy. Um, it says the United States will become a place where new HIV infections are rare, and when they do occur, every person, regardless of age, gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, or socioeconomic circumstances, will have unfettered access to high quality, life-extending care, free from stigma and discrimination. It's a really bold statement, and it's wonderful that they did it. It's a little disappointing that we didn't have a national HIV AIDS strategy until 2010. It's pretty amazing. Uh, especially, get this, it's very United States in some ways, we insisted upon that the countries that we were providing aid to have a national HIV AIDS strategy as a condition of funding, we didn't have a national HIV AIDS strategy until 2010. Um, and 
you know, uh, these folks are my buddies that, that sort of put this together originally, and, um, and now it's just been updated, and I think, you know, covers some more things that are really important. One of the things that's really important, and we did, we've done work on this at Lambda Legal, is the ACA. It has the potential to transform how we are addressing HIV in this country. Um, prior to uh, implementation of the ACA, only 17% of people living with HIV had access to private health insurance. 17%. Everyone else was getting their care through the Ryan White HIV AIDS program, or was not in care at all, um, or was on Medicaid. So the potential for the ACA to turn that number around and actually provide health insurance to most of the people living with HIV in one form or another, either through Medicaid or through the actual marketplaces and the subsidies that are provided um, is enormous and could really make a huge difference. And by the time we, we filed a, an amicus brief in the Supreme Court case that was uh, addressing the constitutionality of, this, uh, of the ACA, uh, where we explained to the court the effect that this could have um, on the people living with HIV and the epidemic. We brought to the court's attention all that information that I just provided with you about if we get people into care, then they actually become non-infectious. And if they become non-infectious, then we, we actually start to get a handle on new infections. Um, and so by the time we filed this brief, it was down to 13% of people in the country living with HIV had access to private health insurance. So it was huge. Um, there was a second case. I don't have a separate slide for it. But we just finished recently, and I don't, I don't know how many of you know, but. About the same time that the Obergefell decision came out, which was the marriage equality decision that came out in June, literally the day before, I think it was the day before, yeah, um, a decision in King v. Burwell came out. And we filed an amicus brief in that case as well, because that was about whether or not the ACA, the marketplaces of the ACA, were going to survive in all of the states where the federal government was running the marketplace, which meant all the states across the south um, and into the Mountain West which, as I told you before, is where the HIV AIDS epidemic is today, mostly you know, sort of growing across the South, which happens to be the same place where they're not expanding Medicaid. All the same states. You can stack it right up, and you can see exactly why we have an epidemic that is growing in the South. We don't seem to care about providing care to the people living there. And I'll, I'll take this moment to have sort of a, a little Black Lives Matter moment. Um, you know, it's such an important conversation that we are now starting to have in this country uh, around whether black lives matter. And um, something that I'm hoping will happen is that people, and the things that they're focusing on are incredibly important. I hope they will also focus on this as an issue. Because if we think that black lives matter, then we would do a much better job of providing care um, related to HIV, uh, because that is the, where HIV is having the most devastating impact today. So I'm hoping that that becomes a part of the conversation around Black Lives Matter. So access to care, incredibly important. However, we also know we're not going to treat our way out of this epidemic. And that's in part what, um, what I you know, came here to talk about um, was the stigma that surrounds HIV. Because you can have all the care in the world, and you know, we, have a, we know how to treat syphilis. But we haven't gotten rid of syphilis. We know how to treat gonorrhea, but we haven't gotten rid of gonorrhea. Um, so along with that, you need a bunch of education, and you need to get rid of the stigma. So unfortunately, about one third of all respondents to a recent Kaiser Family Foundation survey held one of these misconceptions. They believe that transmission could occur through swimming in a pool with someone with HIV that someone could, uh, could occur through touching a toilet seat, or believe that transmission could occur through sharing a drinking glass. One third of all the respondents believed one of those, at least one of those things. So when you have those kinds of misperceptions out there around HIV and how it's even transmitted, of course there's going to be tremendous stigma for people living with HIV. Um, so we need to do a much better job educating people, and we need to get rid of the uh, the misconceptions that they have. Here's another one, actually, which I will venture to say a bunch of people in this room hold some of these misconceptions. We can all look at that last slide and say, come on, really? That's, you, people think that? 
But this one may surprise some of you. So first of all, there is really zero risk of HIV transmission from spitting. I think you probably all knew that. I hope you did. From biting, there is also a zero risk. Or n maybe like if there's a bunch of trauma in the person's mouth and there's extensive tissue damage and the blood of the biter gets, it has to be like in the mouth of the biter. There's some really crazy circumstances that would have to occur for it to happen during a bite. Oral sex. How many people knew that the CDC says low, but when they say low, they mean less than one in 10,000. It may be zero. It's just a really hard thing to measure and to know for sure. Um, so it's really, really, really low, and it might be zero from oral sex. Inserted vaginal intercourse, four in 10,000. Those are the chances of acquiring HIV from a single act of insertive vaginal sex with someone who's HIV positive, four in 10,000. Eight in 10,000 for receptive vaginal intercourse and then insertive anal intercourse about the same at 11 in 10,000. The only place we get to any significant risk, and this also has to do with why HIV is more prevalent in the gay community, is um, the sexual practices of the gay community are actually the riskiest, but even there, it's a less than 2% chance of transmission when you're having sex with someone who's HIV positive in this way. And that doesn't take into account all the things I told you before about PrEP and being on treatment. So it takes those, that risk and lowers it almost 100%. So the risk is actually pretty low. Unfortunately, because people don't know all of this, we end up with HIV criminalization laws. So I don't know if people are aware of this issue, but it's one we've been spending some time on. In 34 of the United States, you can be prosecuted if you are HIV positive and you have sex. Now there's some other things that go on top of that. If you can't prove that you disclosed your status, then you can be prosecuted. So we actually represented this gentleman, Nick Rhodes. Sorry that picture's a little blurry. He's actually a pretty good looking guy. Um, <laughs> And he was, uh, had a one-time sexual encounter in Iowa with someone he met on a hookup site. Uh, they got together, spent a little time together, drank a little bit, had sex. Um, later, the guy finds out that he's HIV positive. Didn't know that. It never came up. They didn't talk about it. Um, and the guy freaks out. And he goes to get care, because um, you can actually take some pills after you've been exposed that work like PrEP. and, and eliminate the possibility of transmission. But he's told at that time, well, he can't do this, you know. That's illegal. You can prosecute him. So he ends up being in the hands of the police. They arrest Nick. He ends up with an attorney who kind of recommends that he, he gets some bad advice. Um, and he ends up pleading guilty, thinking that he will get a light sentence. After his one-time sexual encounter, oh, I forgot to say, he used a condom. Condoms were used. Right? Um, he used a condom, one time sexual encounter, he ends up with a 25 year sentence. No HIV was transmitted, folks. That's not a requirement under this law. 25 years. Now, fortunately for Nick, he was able, there was a big campaign, and he was able to get the sentence reconsidered. Um, although what didn't go away, and I should have mentioned this, also, he has to register as a sex offender. This is adult consensual activity going to result in him registering as a sex offender for, for years, maybe the rest of his life. Um, for, and then, really fortunately for Nick, we came in, um, we represented him in post-conviction proceedings. We took his case all the way up to the Iowa Supreme Court. I think it was probably the hardest case I've ever worked on. And we got the Iowa Supreme Court that had ruled against us in many cases under the statute previously um, against defendants to reconsider what they were doing, and they reversed his conviction. And so he's no longer a felon. He's no longer a sex offender. Um, and at the same time, I worked with advocates in Iowa. Um, at the end of their, they had gone through like a five-year period to reform that law in Iowa. Um, and so we got the law changed as well. And it's a much better law in Iowa than it used to be. But that was one state. There are 39 other states, or 49 other states out there uh, in which someone can be prosecuted for this. So um, unfortunately, it is the stigma, it's the discrimination that drives these prosecutions. Um, I was telling someone today that 
and as a result of some of this, the stigma in the gay community, some people, some long-term survivors say, is worse than it has ever been. It is worse today than it was at the beginning of the epidemic. And that's because of some of these fears of transmission. So we're doing the best we can. We've got to work on stigma. We've got to work on all the areas that we're involved in in order to get rid of the stigma. Um, and if we do, and we provide access to care at the same time, well then I think we can achieve an AIDS-free generation and maybe even eradicate, eradicate HIV one day. So thank you. We now have time for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for us to come to you with a microphone. As always, priority for questions will go to students. Oh, come on, I must have, perked, I must have peaked some more thought than that. Uh, thank you so much for coming and giving this talk. And then, yeah, actually, correct, a lot of my, uh, no, like, knowledge about HIV and but my question is that uh, just coming back to the Charlie Sheen uh, thing is that he has been uh, positive uh, he has had a uh, carry a positive uh, HIV virus for four years and but he kept having sex with multiple people and what's your opinion on that is it possible for an HIV patient to maliciously like having sex with other people without protection because of their con like misconception about HIV. Yeah, so I think uh, what you're talking about, which um, I would describe as a malicious or intentional HIV transmission is extremely rare, right? Most people who become HIV positive um, get on treatment, um, and uh, do, you know, take steps to protect their partner. Um, and even the people that don't do those things aren't necessarily acting out of any malicious intent. I hope part of what I've sort of put across here this evening is there are lots of reasons why a person living with HIV, like myself, would not want to reveal their HIV status, right? Tremendous amounts of stigma that come along with it. Um, once you've revealed it to a potential sexual partner, because let's face it, they're, they're only a potential sexual partner and, and until you do the deed. Um, and once you've revealed that information, now let's say they say, oh yeah, no way. There's nothing really that prevents them from taking that information and doing whatever they want with it. There are some protections in some states, but they're kind of weak. So there's the fear, right, of not only of rejection, which is very real. <laughs> I can attest to that. <laughs> um, but beyond that, there's real ramifications. There's situations where people could uh, experience violence. People that are in um, you know, situations of domestic violence, intimate partner violence, that um, if they reveal that information, um, that they will be subject to violence. There was a woman in Texas who was murdered recently when she disclosed her HIV status to her partner. So um, I think there's some very real reasons why someone would choose not to disclose. And honestly, someone like Charlie Sheen, at least what he says, uh, if we take that at face value, that he has been in treatment um, for that most, that most of that time, or since he learned, uh, and has an undetectable viral load, he's not tra transmitting HIV to anyone. So what kinds of things does a person really need to know? Uh, I would argue that someone I'll use myself as an example. Um, that someone would be safer having sex with, I'll just say an undetected person on, with a suppressed viral load, than they would be to have sex with someone who thinks they're HIV negative, but had sex last week with someone that they don't know. Or even with someone that they know, <laughs> right? Because the fact is, is that when you first become HIV positive is when you are at your most infectious. So if we're gonna have to tell, if I have to tell someone that I'm HIV positive, why don't you have to tell someone that your sex history for the past month? That's actually more indicative of their risk than my HIV status, because I know I'm on treatment. I know what my viral load is. Um, so it gets into this sort of thorny questions. And I could come back and do an entire presentation just on HIV criminalization. 
and walk you through the 15 reasons. You can go to our website if you want and look up the 15 reasons why HIV criminalization harms us all. That's a different talk that I do. But that's part of my answer. Yeah. Um, so I just have a quick logistical question. Um, the transmissions rates that you put up on the slides, mm -hmm. are those um, implying safe sex? And if not, if someone were to participate in safe sex, would those rates be virtually zero? So here they are. And um, they do not attempt to take into account um, condom use or um, treatment as prevention. Which that's kind of my big push right now. We need to expand our definition of what safer sex means and what it means to protect your partner because we now have treatment as prevention, which I said is as effective as condoms, so I would include that in safer sex. Um, and, um, and then people that are on PrEP, that's actually putting it in the hands of the HIV negative person, putting it in their control. So we now have three methods that are all pretty darn close to 100% effective. But these figures are without trying to take that into account. And these are from the CDC. You know, they're, they're done on a meta-analysis of studies around HIV transmission. It's not the type of thing you can do a controlled study on, right? It'd be completely unethical to do such a controlled study. So this is looking at data, and this is their best estimate of what the risks are. Yes, of course, if you put a condom on, you know, you're taking this down. I think condoms are rated as somewhere like 98% effective if they're, you know, used all the time. Um, so it would be 98% reduction from that 11 in 10,000. Pretty darn close to zero. And if you're using a condom during oral sex, well then, God bless you. I don't know who else is doing that, but <laughs> good for you. Hi. Um, I had a question about PrEP. So I know that there's a ton of stigma around PrEP, especially in gay communities, and especially since there are obviously there are a ton of side effects with these drugs. Um, and so how do you think that can be addressed, and do you think it's an actual, like, real step to um, stopping HIV? Thanks. Um, so first I'm going to rejigger a little bit the premise of your question, because there's a myth at this point, really, that there's a ton of side effects around these medications. We've actually done a really good job over the years of dialing the medications in. Um, most side effects that people experience, for, for instance, with Truvada, which is the medication that's been approved for PrEP, um, if they have them, they last about 30 days, and then they go away. Now, there are some effects on um, potentially a person's kidney and liver over time. And that's why you have to have access to care if you're on PrEP, because you have to have those things monitored. Um, but the effects are not as bad. I do agree with you entirely that there's a lot of stigma around PrEP, although I think it is starting to go down. Um, we have, you know, it was only rolled out a couple of years ago. Someone said to me, you know how long it took for the birth control pill to actually sort of be moved into full use and to get over all of its stigma problems? Something like 15 years. So we're still very early in the rollout of PrEP. Um, I think it, they're actually doing a better job now of rolling it out in the gay community. Um, I think we're not doing such a good job of rolling it out in other populations that are susceptible to HIV. Um, you know, heterosexual women, uh, black women in particular, but also Hispanic women um, have high rates of HIV infection, and we're not doing as good a job rolling it out there. Um, and of course, we also have some folks um, who have been out there sort of uh, opposing PrEP and creating some of the stigma around PrEP. For folks that aren't so familiar with this, so there's a, a thing going on around, about Truvada whores, um, meaning there was this accusation that people who are on PrEP um, just want to go out and have a lot of sex and be whores. Um, part of which my answer to that is, and? Right? I mean, part of this is we have to deal with the fact that people want to have sex. I mean, we don't like to deal with that fact in this country, but it is just a truism. And people are going to have sex. And already people are having, and had been having, condomless sex. Um, so I think we just need to acknowledge that there are going to be people that are going to have condomless sex. Um, there's also a, some myth out there that the rates of condomless sex have gone up. Um, the fact is it never got above about 50%. 
Like there's some perception out there that most people were using condoms. They never really rose above 50%, and that's within the gay community. So um, you gotta meet people where they're at. And the fact is, is that lots of people are having condomless sex. If we can give them something, and they're willing to take it on a regular basis, that will prevent tr HIV transmission. Is it as good as condoms? No, but um, it's a game changer, I think. I really do. Can you please share your thoughts on the roles of racism and homophobia on stigmatization and criminalization of HIV AIDS for black gay men? Thanks, Gabriel. Um, Gabriel's a colleague of mine. I should acknowledge him, actually. Um, he came out tonight to, to listen to this, and he is on the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS with me. Um, so, oh, this is such a huge topic. Um, that it's almost hard to, to grasp. I mean, it was in sort of the discussion here. There are so many ways in which racism plays into the equation, right? I mean, I think it's built into why we don't expand uh, Medicaid uh, across the south of this country. Um, I think it's built into why we don't address issues of poverty adequately in this country. The fact is that poverty is the greatest indicator of HIV risk of anything. Um, so. So there's a bunch of that wrapped into there. The criminalization piece, um, I think that we can all see some of the intersections there, right? And, and what the Black Lives Matter movement is addressing. We have, uh, we find it quite easy in this country to criminalize the bodies of black men in particular. Black people in general, but black men in particular. And, and really HIV criminalization is another way in which that happens. And we've seen it play out horribly in some of the prosecutions that have happened around with HIV criminalization. Um, I think it is, I think the laws are actually not overtly sort of targeted at, at one particular population. But I think that when a complaint ends up in the justice system, and most often a complaint ends up in the justice system because somebody who was the partner of that person went and reported them. Um, so, but when a complaint ends up in the system and that uh, the, the defendant happens to be a black person, and a black man in particular, it just all devolves from there. Uh, there was a recent prosecution in Missouri, um, and it was against uh, a black man, uh, and it's just the s subtle, the covert, and the overt racism that was played out and the narrative that was told in that prosecution was horrible. He had. He had had um, sex with multiple uh, men, most of whom were white. And so there was this whole narrative that was played about the white victim of the, uh, sex, the male, black male sexual predator. And um, he ended up being sentenced to uh, 30 years running concurrently. So he actually, two 30-year sentences, 30 years. This is a young man who had his whole life ahead of him and is now going to struggle with trying to get himself out of the um, justice system. So it, it plays a big role. Thank you so much for coming to speak. This has been my um, favorite ACT talk that I've attended this year. Oh, thanks. Um, I wanted to ask you, you spoke about a bit about in terms of like the South and expanding Medicare, Medicaid. Um, what are other like public policy initiatives um, sort of on your horizon that you're working with to improve like just the heartbreaking rates of like how many people have access to care and then um, also in, in addition um, healthcare initiatives in and of themselves that um, you're aware of or that you're prioritizing? Yeah, so um, a couple things there. One, um, we need to keep the Ryan White program uh, robust, right? So while the ACA um, is designed to expand care for most people. Um, it doesn't, one, address undocumented individuals. So undocumented individuals are not within the purview of the ACA. They cannot get the subsidies of the ACA. So we need some type of program. And Ryan White has been sort of the, the, la the last safety net, right? For, it was for most people living with HIV prior to ACA. It needs to remain in place so that we're still catching all the people that do not get coverage under the ACA. Then we need to and I think part of this will be done through policy work. Some of this will need to be done through litigation. We need to ensure that the people living with HIV um, are getting their care at an affordable rate, 
under the ACA. So what we're seeing, and this is not a big surprise, is that the insurance companies want to make a profit. <laughs> I know that's, like, that's earth-shattering news. Um, and we actually had to bring a case down in Louisiana where they were trying to kick everyone who was low income and living with HIV off the rolls there. They thought they'd come up with a way of imposing a no third party payer rule, which they considered Ryan White, the federal government, a third party payer. So they were just no longer accepting third party payments, suddenly, just as the ACA was rolling out. Um, and I would posit that that was all about trying to avoid having to provide care to people living with HIV, low-income people living with HIV. Um, so we need to make sure that the care stays affordable. And there's several parts of that. So uh, insurance companies are putting all the HIV medications on the highest tier, charging not co-pays, which are like a set amount, but co-insurance. So you have to actually pay a percentage of the cost of the medication. It doesn't help if you have access to health insurance if you can't afford the care that you need. So we need to fix those problems. There's other things that they're doing around prior authorizations, making it really difficult for people living with HIV to get the medications that they need, um, to get approved for them, or to get the other types of coverage that they need. Um, making plans transparent um, so that people can actually pick their, they can make sure that their provider is within the plan that they pick, um, and that the plan stays stable during the time that they have enrolled for, because they're sort of doing a bait and switch pulling the rug out from under people once they get them enrolled. So I would say that a bunch of that needs to take place. And then the other piece is access to PrEP. And that's something we haven't really started to tackle yet, but um, making PrEP affordable to everybody. And it's a little trickier because in a legal sense, so people living with HIV have coverage under the ADA and they have coverage under the ACA as people with disabil a, a disability. And that's how they're defined. And so they, we get to protect them sort of, they're a protected class. People at risk of HIV, are not in a protected class, making it much more difficult to come up with a legal theory as to why you can't deny them PrEP, for instance. So those are some of the things I think we need to do. Am I, am I allowed to ask this question? <laughs> okay. um, so, and so far as destigmatizing is part of you know, making these numbers available to people, <coughs> sorry, in part of destigmatizing, I'm guessing it's part of making these numbers, these lower, surprisingly lower rates of transmission available to people. But isn't there a concern? Like, how do you make these true facts available to people without discouraging safe sex? Yes, that's exactly the problem. Great question. Um, so this is one of the reasons you don't know these numbers, is because public health doesn't want you to know these numbers. Um, my, my take on it is, is that um, eventually the truth will out. So instead of trying to sort of hide the truth or um, sort of fake your way around it, I think you need to embrace it. And, and this is the really tricky part, how to get people to understand risk even though the numbers are what they are. So this is based on a per act risk. Well, that means this, this you do this one time. If you do this 50 times in a year, well, then your risk is very different than the number you're seeing here. That's a really hard concept to get people to wrap their heads around. Um, but I think we need to do it, and I think we need to um, just continue to send the other messages. I think once we uh, embrace the other forms of prevention, it'll be a heck of a lot easier to get people to uh, engage in them um, when they know what all of their options are. And so I think that's one way around it. Um, unfortunately, what I would say is right now, the result of trying to maybe hold back on some of this information is that the HIV positive people that I represent end up bearing the brunt of it, like Nick Rhodes, because he gets sentenced to 25 years because everybody's ignorant about how HIV is and or is not transmitted and what the risks really are. So to make the system fair, we need to, we need to get the information out there. Henrietta? Oh, you got one there? Sorry. All right, thanks, thanks for coming. Uh, I take it the death rate from AIDS has gone way down, and I would guess that the morbidity has also gone down, and that someone could make up a list of the number of years of life which have been saved from moving from the baseline of 1983, let's say. 
Could that be broken? And then it could be broken down into how much of it is new medicine, how much of it is additional treatment, how much of it is behavioral change, how much of it is legalizing an authority gay marriage. I wonder if anyone has done anything like that. It's actually, I think it's pretty hard to calculate some of those things, like how much of it is, a, is as a result of this versus this. Um, I do think that there are people that can and have been calculating. I mean, first of all, we know about life expectancy. As I said at the beginning, my life expectancy is, they, they say someone who's newly infected at age 25, who's diagnosed in a timely fashion, that's important, has access to care and treatment. So we haven't really put those things fully in place yet. But that when you have those things, that person has a life expectancy that is four months, four to six months shy of a person without HIV. So yeah, we've got to be saving. We're saving a ton of life years um, as a result of this. Unfortunately, there are still plenty of people dying. I and mean, as I said at the beginning, you know, 9,000 or so, this is a, some back of the envelope math I did, um, but about 9,000 people uh, in 2012. Um, and that's because we don't provide access to care and treatment to folks. Because people are afraid to come in and get tested, sometimes they're afraid of being criminalized um, uh, in these statutes. Um, but there are lots of other reasons why people don't come in or they don't want to go and be seen at the HIV clinic. They live in rural areas where there's like one place to go and everybody knows everybody. And so that's one of the reasons they're not retained in care. Or they don't have transportation to get them to the care. So until we're doing better on all of those fronts, um, we're going to continue to see the disparities. And yes, we'll be saving life years, but we'll be saving mo life years mostly among the most privileged of us. Um, and that's what we've got to fix. Hi. Thank you for taking the question. Um, going back to the criminalization of HIV, yeah. of the, the, the case in Iowa, did, did that have any difference with any of the laws on the books, any other states that have the laws on the books? And also, second part, civil cases. Are there civil cases, or can there be civil cases if there aren't any now, where they're suing for monetary damages, either even if the virus wasn't transmitted for like a psychological whatever, PTSD, what have you, or care if they were infected and the payment of the, the care, you know? Yes. So um, also both good questions. Um, so the criminalization piece, we hope to take the result of the case and use it in other courts. Um, that hasn't really happened yet, but that certainly is on our agenda as the attorneys that are working on this, um, is to take that outcome and go to courts in other states that have these laws and that where there have been prosecutions, um, and in those cases make the point that the Iowa Supreme Court got this, you should apply it here. It doesn't have any binding effect outside of Iowa. So the only place it's gonna have a direct effect is in Iowa, which the other piece I'll say is in Iowa we changed the law which I will say maybe is the bigger of the two because w how this really needs to change is through legislation. We need to go into the states that have the laws and fix them. And having a state that has done it, um, it's not perfect, their new law, but it's a lot better. And so if we have a model that we can take other places and a model for creating the change, the legislative change, um, I say that, and that's happening right now. There's actually a movement uh, underway here in California, and I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you about it so that you can all go and become a part of it. California HIV Criminalization Reform is the name of the group, CHCR, and, um, and I'm working with them. I actually ended up, I wrote the bill in Iowa that became the law, and, um, and so I'm working with other groups on coming up with the bills that will work in their state. So that's on that piece. The civil piece, and it's interesting because I've been answering this question around the Charlie Sheen issue a little bit. Um, it's actually pretty hard to bring a civil case um, to, to make someone liable for this uh, issue. And there's several reasons behind that. One, for the most part, it's like getting blood out of a turnip, right? So the, 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 the judgment or the, the result is monetary damages. If you are like most people living with HIV, you don't have a lot of money for someone to go after. So that's number one. Two, it's also true there has to be damages that you can prove. And so um, if you did not contract HIV, then you're relying on emotional damages and, um, you know, I think the civil realm would be the place to do this because there is actually some apportionment of liability, at least in some states. Um, but the fact is it took two people to decide to have consensual condomless sex. So yeah, you can point the finger at the other person, but you had something as the plaintiff, you were part of that decision too. Um, and so, 
So I think that that you know, plays out in those cases and plays into the minds of juries. Um, now that we know a lot more about the other things that prevent HIV, I think that will have an effect on how those cases go. There have been those kinds of cases. Um, and Charlie Sheen may be facing a few because he does have deep pockets. Um, but it's not as easy, I think, to win on those as, as people might imagine. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions tonight. Please join me in thanking our speaker. Thank you.